everybody. I'm Gary Lloyd. I'm the uh, historian for the Cahaba Homestead Heritage Foundation. And today I've got a special guest to talk with, uh, Nick Taylor. He's the author of a number of nonfiction books, uh, including the one we're going to discuss today, American Made, The Enduring Legacy of the WPA, When FDR Put the Nation to Work. Nick, welcome in and uh, thanks for joining today. How, how are you doing? I'm good, Gary. Thanks. I'm glad to be with you. So first, just tell me a little bit about yourself, uh, about your background and, you know, that kind of thing. Well, I, um, I used to have at least an accent pretty much like yours. I was born in North Carolina, grew up in Florida and um, I worked around, including Atlanta. I was in Atlanta for 13 years and uh, uh, at that point came to New York. So I was a newspaper journalist and TV journalist. I worked in politics. I uh, worked for Jimmy Carter. I worked for John Lewis in his first congressional campaign. And then I decided, well, um, it's time to start writing books. And uh, I've fortunately been able to do that. I don't have the imagination for fiction, but uh, they say that truth is just as interesting. And I found it that way. I definitely understand that. I think Twain said that somewhere back uh, years and years ago. Could have been. <laughs> uh, how'd you come to write American Made? Well, you know, I was looking for, I was look. it's a long story, but, um, but I'll try to shorten it. Um, I wanted to do a big book. I had written about uh, uh, mafia family and the witness protection program. I wrote about my parents in their final years. Um, I wrote about the invention of the laser, which forced me to learn physics, which I found out was easier to understand than patent law. And um, I just, I, I wanted to do, I didn't, in all of the histories of the Roosevelt administration and the New Deal generally, I didn't feel that the uh, WPA um, and the infrastructure projects generally had been broken out and really studied the way they should have been. And that's what I wanted to do. And it hadn't been done before in a single volume history. And boy, uh, you know, when you start tackling the Roosevelt administration and the New Deal, you uh, quickly learn how much you uh, don't know, but how much there is to know and how much there is to convey. And so um, I'm, a, I'm a firm believer in the New Deal and, um, and what it did for this country uh, running up to World War II, which really ended the Depression as opposed to the New Deal itself and the WPA and so forth. And I... Uh, and, and, you know, it took me eight years, and, uh, but I, it was eight years well spent. And that was, I mean, that, that really touches on what my next question was. I mean, you said eight years. I'm, I'm curious, what was, that, what was that process like in terms of research, interviews, all those different things? Well, the, um, you know, the National Archives has the, um, the state um, uh, WPA projects. And, um, and fortunately, I knew some people. And I got friends who knew some people, have some, had some friends who knew some people who had actually worked for the WPA. And um, fortunately, I w stayed in touch with a lot of people who told me, call this fellow in Silva, North Carolina. He worked for the WPA. I went to school at Western Carolina University in Cullowee near Silva, North Carolina. And um, down the street from me here in New York, lived a man who'd done uh, some publicity for the WPA theater project. And then um, somebody in California that I knew told me about a man who'd worked for the WPA writers project. And I, um, I got in touch with these people. I went out to San Francisco. Um, I talked to, I, I found enough people who had worked for the WPA that I could intersperse their stories with the um, administrative history of the WPA, which is pretty interesting in itself because of Harry Hopkins who um, went, to, uh, went to Grinnell College in Iowa and, and came out of a social service background. And his beliefs along with um, Franklin Roosevelt's and Eleanor Roosevelt's and other people in administration informed the idea that the obligation of the government was to its people, all its people. And um, it was a story that was richly worth telling. And I, you know, had the voices of people who actually had been there um, and worked for the WPA to help, to help tell it. 
That's really cool. Um, why, why do you think through all that research, why did the WPA work so well? Um, because Harry Hopkins, by the way, I'm going to, I'm going to add something here. Sure. This is Harry Hopkins. <laughs> uh, this is a Time Magazine cover, and uh, it shows him lighting up a cigarette, which, of course, uh, is not de rigueur these days. But uh, Harry Hopkins was, a, um, was, was the engine of the New Deal. Uh, and again, as I said, came out of a social service background and believed, it, believed in helping people. Um, why did it work so well? Because of the instinct that Roosevelt and Hopkins and others in the administration had that people wanted to work. There was the fear. It's, when, when Roosevelt became president in 1933, he, um, 25% of the country was out of work, right? And, um, and so he passed the initial funding was for uh, simply checks to people. But they understood that um, that people wanted to work. There's a, there's a pride in work. Uh, that people prefer to get a paycheck for working than to get a paycheck for nothing. That argument, of course, is still going on today. But um, it worked. And and of course, let's let's remember also that this is 1933, right, when Roosevelt was inaugurated. And the WPA didn't come along until 1935 because there was something called the Civil Works Administration, which um, happened over the winter of 1934 into 1935. And um, they thought, well, maybe that'll end the unemployment problem, but it didn't. And so the WPA uh, really started uh, putting people on the job end of the summer, September, 1935. Um, the, um, again, your researchers probably told you that the Civilian Conservation Corps, which hired young men and sent them into the National Parks and Forests to um, dig, dig fire breaks and plant trees and so forth, was actually the first jobs program of the New Deal. But that was only for young men, um, I think up to age 26, and they made $30 a month, which they had to spend, send $25 home to their families. Right. Um, and the employment, large part of employment in the WPA was people who were on relief um, and didn't have other jobs and, uh, and people were eager to work and, and, and it, they maintained their, their skills at masonry, carpentry, yeah. whatever it happened to be. Um, but it, it worked because people wanted to work. Um, and I can go further and say that it worked because the WPA had the genius to say, okay, look, um, we've got musicians out of work. We've got writers out of work. We've got uh, theater people out of work. Um, and they didn't think uh, that it would be a good idea to make a first rate musician into a second rate a road builder. <laughs> Right. So, um, so they 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 uh, formed a WPA circus and the theater project. They uh, did the writers project, which did guides to uh, every American state and city, or not every city, of course, but the larger cities, U.S. territories. Um, the music project gave countless assembled orchestras and bands and entertain people for free. They, they, they not only, so the WPA hired people to do what they did, what they could do, what they were good at, what they were professional at. And in so doing, they, they entertained and informed the country um, and, and, you know, let's, made people happier. <laughs> yeah. Did you, uh, in your research, did you come across much in the way of individual communities that, whether they be WPA or resettlement administration communities, did you get to visit any? Did you get to research any? I didn't really spend a lot of time on, on, the, on the resettlement administration. And I'll, um, you know, I know that you're dealing with a um, preserving, I guess, a resettlement administration project in Alabama there. 
Yeah. Uh, but I'm looking at page 293 of my book, and it says, um, let's see. We're talking about Catherine Kellogg, who's one of the, um, one of the inspirations for the WPA Writers Project. And uh, it says, I wrote, her first New Deal job had been in the Resettlement Administration, an experiment in collective farming that salt, sought, ultimately unsuccessfully, to move farmers from land gone bad from drought and, or overplanting and reestablish them in new communities or with access to good land. So, I mean, the idea was there, and, and maybe Cahaba was more successful than most. Um, you'll remember um, from the history of those years that the Dust Bowl was a big problem as well. It's when not only the um, collapse of the stock market had people out of work, but um, there was a huge drought in, in the West, in the Western Midwest, right. that. Uh, caused dust storms that, you know, would deposit dust on the decks of ships sailing the Atlantic Ocean. They were that, they were that devastating. And, um, and, and the, uh, uh, that was the impetus behind the resettlement administration to move people off bad land and put them in, yeah. assemble them around good land. But, yeah. um, you know, I, I, I that was, that was awfully ambitious compared with giving people jobs at uh, the kinds of things that they could do. And, and um, it was, I think, uh, one of those, maybe it was a bridge too far, I don't know. And again, you know more about Cahaba than, than I do. And, uh, and I suspect that some of these communities were successful. And, but, um, and, I'll, and I'll interject there, and that's why Cahaba, the Cahaba Homestead, Cahaba Village, there, there are several names they use for it, uh, Slag Heap Village. Uh, the reason that it was successful and is mostly still intact some 85 years later is that, I mean, you could have chickens, you could have those kind of things, but they made it more of a model of, suburban life and okay. i don't know if that had to do i think it had to do more with uh the railroad first came to trustful the city that the cahaba project is in uh mm -hmm. in during reconstruction i think it was 1870 that it reached here obviously birmingham alabama's 15 minutes down the road right and so while this was a resettlement administration project when when uh the resettlement uh the government officials were here planning the community, they saw it a little more uniquely than, you know, here's your three and five acres to farm. They, right. they, it was almost like they saw beyond those current struggling years post-depression and yeah. saw a model community for the future. And it's mostly still intact today. There, there have been maybe a handful of fires uh, we've seen some home demolitions in recent years, but largely out of the 200, I think 287 homes were part of this. It's largely intact today. I mean, it's uh, literally a step back in time when you, when you walk through there and, uh, you know, the, they've got a, uh, Cahaba elementary school is there, which that school was originally the city's high school. Uh, that's right in the middle of this neighborhood. There's mm -hmm. a, uh, a huge lawn called the mall and it was it's facing that school and it's meant to kind of emulate the national mall in washington dc okay. we just well, i would guess i would guess that the high school is probably built by the wpa uh or the public works administration but uh um you know they built to last so that's a good thing yeah is it community or building wise anything you've come across in your in writing this book do you, do you feel like it's kind of unique these days? Uh, you know, 2020, we're in 2021 now. Right. Do you see these communities or school buildings or anything like that largely still intact? Oh, yes. Um, you should, um, there's something called the Living New Deal, and you can go yeah. online and find the Living New Deal, mm -hmm. and they are mapping They've got a, a huge push pin map that tells you where the surviving yeah. WPA and uh, New Deal projects generally are in, um, in the United States. They just not long ago issued a map 
of Washington, D.C. Um, there are a lot of uh, WPA. The WPA built, I think, 11 Olympic-sized swimming pools in New York City, all of which are still in use today. Obviously, they've been renovated. Yeah, um, sure. But, uh, oh, the, 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 the number of, of WPA projects and public administration, uh, uh, um, uh, there, there was the, the, um, the WPA and the Public Works Administration, mm -hmm. which was the difference between the two is that the WPA hired workers on relief and the Public Works Administration was just a big uh, infrastructure, um, a nationwide infrastructure project. The, the PWA uh, built Hoover Dam, for example, or finished the Hoover Dam. Um, and that was more of a top-down kind of thing. One of the, another of the secrets of the WPA is that the projects all bubbled up. There was a big um, um, kind of uh, vetting board in, in, in New York, or not in, in Washington, that uh, took projects, project applications from states and cities and, and, um, and, and counties and, and passed on them all. So all of the projects were deemed locally desirable. And that was, the wor that was one of the reasons they, they worked and were successful. And again, because the people who were doing this work if they didn't know how to do it at the beginning, learn to do it. And, and, and they, then they built things very, very well. I mean, it really, when you look and, and probably your Alabama history is all of our, all of us Southerners know from our local history, um, you know, there wasn't a lot, there wasn't electricity before the TVA, which is a new deal project in a lot of the rural South and Appalachian South. There was not electricity in the rural West uh, until the uh, damming of the Colorado River, which, you know, among other things, gave us uh, um, the, the bright lights of uh, Las Vegas. Um, and uh, when we talk about infrastructure today, and we're having this discussion as we speak, or they're having it in Washington, um, the United States in 19 in the 1930s was had much of much of the United States rural United States anyway uh, had really a, uh, a 19th century infrastructure and the WPA and the Public Works Administration helped bring this country's infrastructure into the 20th century now we're looking for infrastructure to take us into the 21st century uh, where uh, in a lot of places it's not reached yet right I like what you said about things being well built. I have conversations here locally all the time with, with folks. I haven't lived in one of those homes. I've been in those homes in the Cahaba project. But uh, even last week, I, I talked to someone who said we were experiencing some, some bad weather down here. It's that time of year. And he said, I'm not worried because my house is built like a tank. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they... You know, it's an interesting thing. Some of the things that you thought might be a, a detriment to the work uh, turned out to be a plus. They spent much of their money on, uh, most of their money, I think it was supposed to be 85% on, 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 on labor. Um, and that meant that in many cases, the um, materials had to be found locally. And so you're dealing with, with local stone, um, things like that, local wood, uh, shingles, so on and so forth. Um, but in so many cases that work to the, to, you know, to make the projects better and stronger and, 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 and provided building materials that are better than they might've been otherwise. And again, they, you know, they, they, did, they did good work. They did, and that, and that again, I, I spoke with a, a different neighbor uh, this past weekend actually, who, who kind of posed that to me. We were looking at uh, the types of jobs that people were able to get in the construction of the Cahaba project between 1936 and 1938. Mm -hmm. And um, we were looking at what they made per hour. And he asked, he asked me this question. He said, speaking to how well built those homes were, how much time went into them. He said, what do you, what do you think it was so well built. And I said, well, I don't really know what you mean, but just give me the answer, right? 
And he said, when that brick mason, when that carpenter, when that, you know, whatever position you were able to get, whenever you were finished with your job, now you no longer had a job again. So it almost <laughs> behooved them to be thorough and build it as well as possible. And in a way, you know, two years for 287 homes in the 30s is to me is really fast. But apparently yeah. for them, you know, that was just incredibly thorough and incredibly well built structures that were meant or were built to last. And we're still seeing that today with most of that neighborhood still intact. Yeah. Well, now you're going to have um, uh, the, the countervailing argument at the time was that um, and you, you would see pictures of photographs. And I spent a lot of time in the National Archives when I was doing my research. Um, and you see photographs of uh, long lines of men with, with wheelbarrows, right? Mm. And, uh, and you'll see other, other um, uh, just men assembled with shovels. And so because the WPA had to spend the majority of its budget on labor, you had a lot of people digging and filling wheelbarrows and a lot of people pushing those wheelbarrows to you know put the dirt wherever it's supposed to go right. and coming back with those wheelbarrows and while the wheelbarrows were gone the guys were um and were were standing waiting for the wheelbarrows to come back so they'd have some place to um put the what they dug up with their shovels uh, right. that dirt again um that was a design of, of the WPA, and it, but of course the, uh, the conservatives of the time would uh, call this, um, there was a word invented um, during, the, <laughs> during the New Deal called boondoggles. Boondoggling was, um, it stands now for kind of a, you know, a make work, make work job of not much, didn't produce much value. Um, that started at a, um, at a New York Board of Aldermen hearing where people were uh, asked to do what kind of, what does it say, what, talk about what kind of jobs they had under the, uh, under the Roosevelt administration. And one guy taught a crafts to, uh, to, to, to kids. And he said he taught boondoggles, which is a kind of a, uh, a when you might weave a leather keychain or a key fob or something like that. Right. And, um, and so boondoggling became a word for um, uh, the conservative media would print articles like this week's boondoggle. And there was always something uh, to do with the WPA. But in fact, the, um, as you point out, the, um, the work was largely good. It was, you saw people with long line. Oh, and uh, another satirist um, uh, came up with something called the WPA shovel, which had a, a whole a handle that you could you could um, you could fold down to lean on. <laughs> but uh, that was that was really sniping at a very um, yeah. very effective project because right. the work, um, as as we've discussed, lasts today. And um, and and it's because you know when people work, um, you know. Uh, and I think that the, the failure to understand this is amazing to me, but most people when they work want to do a good job and, um, and they want to keep working as you point out, but um, they want their work to last. They don't want to work, go back to have to you know, fix it. And, um, and, 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 and the idea that, there's, that people find dignity in work um, and that they, they, that, that dignity is reflected in, not only in the paycheck that they receive, but in the work that they've done, um, is, is really f a fundamental, um, um, American, if not a human characteristic. You want to do a good job. I mean, um, I, you know, you're, you're, um, you're working from home doing a podcast about the Cahaba project and, um, and, you know, you're doing it well. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's not, it's sloppiness is not as, uh, um, is, is, is really not an option for, for most workers, I think. Yeah. For you, uh, specifically from this book, 
what what was the what was the coolest thing you learned in your process whether it be about the WPA about FDR what what was the coolest thing wow well the coolest thing was to really be able to talk to people who had actually worked for the WPA and had those uh, memories of of uh, of uh, what it was like I uh, one of the guys I talked to was named Tony Butita, Anthony Butita. And he worked, he had worked as a theater publicist and he had, um, there, there, was, um, there, was a, there was a, there was a production, uh, the, the WPA theater project was, had several divisions in New York. There was a, um, there was a Jewish theater um, there was a, a black theater in New York and the black theater under, under Orson Welles and John Hausman produced something called the Voodoo Macbeth. It came to be known as the Voodoo Macbeth. It was Macbeth set in Haiti and, um, and it was with an all black cast. And, you know, it was, and, and instead of three witches, around their their cauldrons they had a um the wpa had there was a there was a touring um black drumming group african drumming group that had gotten stranded on a tour because nobody could afford to go to the theater anymore so these these folks were the became the new witches and um this thing was a cause celeb in new york you wouldn't believe and everybody went uptown um and, um, and, 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 and from Harlem surrounding the theater where, the, where this production of the Voodoo Macbeth was, um, and that wasn't the official name, it was just Macbeth, but it became known as the Voodoo Macbeth. Um, it, was, it was quite a remarkable piece of, of theater, which I hadn't known anything about. And uh, the fact that Orson Welles was director and John Hausman was the producer uh, was, was significant as well. That was one of the neatest things I learned. And this guy, Tony Boutita, told me all about doing publicity for that. And then he later did publicity work for Billie Holiday. So that was, that was just an example of, the, of the, the cool things that I learned. Yeah, that's neat. Why do you think, you know, because you, you mentioned, and I'm looking at the book right here, but you had mentioned, uh, you know, getting all of this in one volume and, yeah. you know, having not seen that done and you wanted everything, you know, in one spot, essentially. That's something that, honestly, I want to do. Obviously, not to this scale. I mean, this is the entire WPA. I mean, this is eight years of work. But locally, our own Cahaba project, you know, there are the, those stories are there, folks who were born in that project, you know, the, the first baby born in that project, he's, he's still alive and living here. Uh, people who have lived in those homes their entire lives, but you know, when you think about that time, they are th their age is getting up there. Yes. And, you know that even just the homes themselves, you know, at some point, uh, as well built as they are, you know, from time to time, you're going to find one that does require a demolition or you know whatever it might be. Why do you think it's important uh, to kind of? preserve those stories, you know, have them in one place, have them, you know, kind of that definitive local history down. Is it just so that people don't forget it so that they know where they come from? What's important about that to you? Well, it's not only that people don't forget it, but it's um, so that people can apply that history to current life. I mean, here we look at um, infrastructures being argue, argued now. Um, about and what is infrastructure? Well, um, it was roads and bridges, of course, even in um, even in the, in the day. And um, but was it also um, was it also water? Sure, it was. It was damming water provide, to provide electricity and also irrigating California Central Valley. Now we're talking about a whole different technological world in which. Infrastructure includes broadband, extending broadband into areas that didn't have, uh, it's, it's like electrifying the rural South, the Appalachian South. Um, you know, broadband has the same significance today 
as electricity did then. Uh, you, 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 you learn from history and, and how it applies today. Um, and you learn to, for example, talk in terms of investment as opposed to spending. And you see that, um, I mean, you look at, when you look at the WPA, which built a lot of airports around the country, like 600 airports. And before that, there weren't many airports in major cities around the country. You know, airplanes were just getting uh, big enough to carry passengers from between cities. And, um, and so the money that the WPA put into building airports jump-started the age of commercial aviation. Now, would anybody argue that that's just spending as opposed to investment and allowing private corporations to make a lot of money? The same thing is true of roads and bridges. It helps people get to work. It helps um, goods be delivered from farmers to market and, 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 and trucks to get from one place to another with, um, you know, trucks full of, uh, of products that people want to buy. And so what looking at the past and the results of what happened does um, allows you to see the, the, the present more clearly and, and, and what the correct path of, of, uh, of, of, of government to take is. I mean, I, I, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a believer and, um, and, and Joe Biden seems to be uh, uh, thinking along the same lines that, you know, really um, when you're faced with, with, with broad problems like uh, financial inequality, um, that, that government is, you know, nobody thinks that they want anything to do with government until suddenly there's a hurricane or a tornado or an earthquake um, or flood or a mudslide. Um, you know, government has a purpose and by and large, it's, it's not, um, you know, it's, it's not bureaucrats twiddling their thumbs and, and, and just trying to make work. They're, they're you know, trying to improve things for the majority of people. That, that certainly seems like where the WPA or the resettlement administration, those groups, it seems like to me that they were so much trying to fix something that was, had obviously just happened in the Great Depression. But, you know, I, I look at it almost, they were almost wise beyond their years in a way. Um, I've, I've seen specifically to the homes here in the Cahaba Project where, you know, some of the homes are, are duplexes. You have really big ones. Some uh -huh. of them are really small single family homes, not a lot of square footage. Um, and a lot of people have renovated those homes or made additions uh, in the back of the home because the lots right. are too big. And, you know, I've heard people in the past, you know, say that they didn't think they could add on to these homes, for instance. Well, I was looking not long ago at the... Uh, the resettlement administration's like official blueprints of the various types of homes they built here. And on some of those, those smaller uh, types, you can read it plain as day from 1936. They've got a spot in their blueprints that says future edition. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the thought process was already there even in 1936. And those future additions are happening today in 2021, just as they drew it up, you know, 80 plus years ago. And that yeah. just, that amazes me. Well, what you, the argument today is pretty much the same as the argument was in the, in the 1930s. I mean, Roosevelt was, was, um, you know, accused of being a socialist or having socialist thoughts. And the, um, um, the people who weren't unemployed didn't really think, oh, well, we don't really need all this, all this, all these workers doing these, these projects. Um, but of course, the 25% of the people that were unemployed, you know, did <laughs> need sure. those projects. Um, the, I, I uh, you know, the, 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 the conservative, I don't, I don't, you know, want to make a political argument here, but um, the 1936 campaign was pretty much like, you know, today's um, 
um, um, social or liberal or progressive versus conservative argument. Um, you know, Roosevelt was a socialist and, um, and he did, you know, established social security and unemployment compensation and all these things that um, really went on along with the GI Bill after World War II created the largest, most prosperous middle class in the history of the world. Um, but, but on the other hand, you would, you would have people saying, well, it's just social engineering to, 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 to have a resettlement administration to take people off their land that wasn't working and put them into land that was where around land that was working. And, um, you know, those, those arguments are always going to be, uh, always going to, um, you know, prompt the, um, the disparity between um, liberal or progressive thought and conservative thought. But if you look at the results um, and you look at the, um, again, if, if you look at what happened after World War II, really, when um, uh, the, the middle class, the, the executive salaries were much closer to regular ordinary salaries than they are today. Um, and you look at the, again, we're talking about a time in which the, the husband is usually the breadwinner of most families, um, but could, could support a family on, a, on, a, on one job. Um, you know, these things are, are, you know, you have to think about them um, as, as time goes on. Are we, are we a better country uh, today than we were, say, in 19... In the 1960s, 1970s, um, you know, more people had more wealth, but a lot of people have been left behind. Um, and again, then you get into the question of social engineering and, uh, and, and uh, you know, um, in spreading income around in a way that it shouldn't be spread around. But, um, you know, there's, a, there's an argument on, on, on behalf of... of uh, you know, higher taxes and um, shrinking the uh, the difference between the highest salaries and the and ordinary worker salaries, so that people don't have to have two and three jobs to to um, to to support a family. Um, and you know, again, history in, informs us. Um, and again, you know, going back to what we talked about very very early on, um, people argue that the New Deal didn't 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 uh, end the depression, and that's and that's correct. It really took the the job demands of World War II, um, munitions and, yeah. and and armament and and, and military uh, materiel um, needed to be manufactured in huge huge numbers, and that put people everybody back to work. And it was after the war that uh, that the middle class grew, and um, you know really became just an example that we somehow lost sight of uh, in the years, in the last 40 years, say. Um, and, and the inequality that we see today uh, is, is, you know, one of the results of that. Well, it's definitely good to look back. I, I love just talking about the history, you know, uh, you know, looking back at FDR's uh, terms and, uh, definitely finding more and more about this WPA that, that's in your book. And as I dig into more of this resettlement administration, uh, you know, that, that's something that, that our group really is after. Uh, we're, we're after, you know, anything educational we can come across uh, specific to our, our little section of that time's history, you know? Yeah. yeah. Um, it, it's almost like I've, I've talked to some history teachers around town and you know, I'm like when, when y'all when y'all study the the Great Depression, do you do you just walk out the school and walk into that neighborhood, you know, and talk about the depression, the the resettlement administration? Because I, I mean, it's right in your backyard. I mean, you talk about doing something that's like a hands-on field trip kind of thing, as opposed to just sitting in a classroom with you know with a textbook open. I mean, that living history is there. And uh, that, that's what really grabs my attention. Not, not so much the, the politics of it all, whether it be back then or especially today. 
I, I don't watch it either side. I, you know, I, I just don't. But I love learning about those people's stories, how yeah. they, how, how they uh, came to live in one of those homes, what, uh, what obstacles they were facing and, you know, how they went through that rental process for one of those homes, the work they had to do just to get by that kind of stuff that right. it just, to me, really gets at the heart of that. Just, just a truly American story. You know what I mean? Exactly. And you can tell that story if you if you're looking at Cahaba um, and you look at, for example, uh, how people move, where people were before they lived there, came to live yeah. there, what their circumstances were. And then you look at um, the, the, the community as time goes on. And uh, presumably they're all privately owned now. Is that correct? That's right. Yeah. So, so how did that happen? What was the political consideration in, 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 in making them available, homes that have been government built, um, and, um, and, 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 and telling that story? I mean, you really, you're telling, you're telling history, and it's significant history. And it's, it's so much fun because, um, as, as you clearly intuit yourself and, and, you know, because you're involved with this and, and have been, um, it's, it's, it's really dynamic. I mean, it's, you're, you're telling the stories of people, but you're, you're telling uh, an administrative story as well. And, um, and, and, and as you look at one small community uh, that just from the outside may seem ordinary, but you're going to find that there are extraordinary stories, yeah. which, which, you know, tell the story of America in a way. A little slice, but it's still the same story. Right. It's a piece of the bigger pie. That's right. Exactly right. Exactly yeah. right. Well, Nick, I think that's just a perfect spot to end this, if you if you don't mind, just uh, tell people where they can where they can find this book if they've got interest in reading it. Well, absolutely, American Made is in print, and it's been in print since it came out um, as a, a trade paperback. And you can get it at Amazon. You can order it from Barnes and Noble. You can order it from uh, really any bookstore can get their hands on it. And uh, you know, it's it's also available as um, uh, back in the days when they were. Um, CDs or, uh, you know, uh, audio discs. Uh, it had a lot of, it's an, it's available as an audio book uh, uh, with, a, with, I think you can probably stream it now as opposed to uh, sticking the discs in a disc drive that nobody has anymore. But, uh, but you can order it from any bookstore. And, uh, and I, I'm very proud of this book. I think it tells a good story. I think it, uh, the, the, the human story of the people who work for the WPA is, is part of the administrative history, but I think it's an exciting and informative time in our, in our, um, in our history. And I think that uh, when you uh, have finished your book about the Cahaba Project, it's going to be another piece of that uh, informative and richly um, informative and educational history.